The Committee on um, Appropriations and Adjudication will reconvene at this time. As we begin this budget process for fiscal year 2019, I want to thank everyone for your presence here today. I understand that several agencies that I've requested to be here today are not traditionally part of this process, but as you are aware, this legislature created Chapter 1A, Title V of the Guam Code annotated relative to government reorganization via Public Law 34-87. The intent of this policy is to prioritize the expenditure of limited government revenues to those agencies with what has identified as a higher priority number, thereby generating government savings and promoting increased efficiency whenever possible. As the committee begins to consider and review the budgetary needs of the government of Guam for fiscal year 2019, it is imperative that this community fully comprehend your agency's requirements for funding from general fund or special fund revenues appropriated by Ilehe or lack thereof. Prior to this hearing, I sent letters to each agency present today asking you to provide testimony answering specific questions relative to your agency's missions, how you measure that achievement of your missions and other relevant matters. For the autonomous agencies, these are committee hearings because I am fully aware that, I do not, that you do not submit your budgets to this body for review and approval. Rather, you have your respective governing bodies that hold that responsibility. Though this may be the case, your agencies were identified in the government reorganization statute, and I want to give you the opportunity to inform the public with your answers. For the executive branch line agencies, though I'm aware that your appropriation levels, um, <clears throat> level of various agency requests requested in the FY19 budget, your responses to the items above are for the benefit of the public. I want the public to understand that for these line agencies, the governor submitted two options. Option one, assumed a business privilege tax that was increased 2%, whereas the other option assumed no business privilege tax increase or sales tax increase. Please note that while your testimony to the committee should be specifically to answer these questions, I have scheduled numerous other agencies to testify today. As such, please limit your in-person presentation to no more than 25 minutes with a copy of your written testimony due no later than the close of business. At that, uh, let's start with the way that we had it on. Um, we'll start with Peels. Anybody here from Peels? The Guam Board of Registration for Professional Engineers, Architects, and Land Surveyors. Turn on the mic. Very good. Good afternoon. Actually, morning. Good morning. <clears throat> well, um, the uh, questions, I, I, uh, the Peel's Board mission is uh, to protect the public, and uh, uh, the questions were, um, how do we achieve this? Uh, we achieve this by ensuring that those that are licensed to practice are qualified uh, and uh, we, with various tests with the, with the National Councils for the Engineers, the National Council Examinations for Engineers and Surveyors, also the National Council of the Architectural Registration Boards that allows us to, uh, the applicants for, uh, that are applying for registration to ensure that they're qualified by taking the exams requiring that they meet the minimum uh, years of experience to practice engineering or architecture in Guam. Uh, and uh, the, uh, also uh, the Pills Board, we, we're an enforcement agency that uh, those that are practicing out of their discipline, we would uh, uh, issue fines, and then those that are practicing without being registered, we also issue them fines. Do you generate your own funds or do you receive funds from the general fund for your uh, operations? We generate our own funds. So you receive no general fund appropriation? 
That's correct. And typically, we generate more than we, we, uh, we spend. Congratulations. Yes. Can we borrow it? Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> yeah, we were, we're one of those special fund agencies that... Uh, but you fully fund, you self-generating funds and uh, it's not general fund or tax That's revenue. correct. Yes, sir. And, and you get those fees by fees paid by um, architects and engineers. The, the re annual registration fees, also there's fees for examination, there's fees for firm registration, the COA. I sent some slides and, and also there's uh, fees for um, um, yeah, so the examinations, most of our fees comes from individual registrations. That's roughly about 70% of our annual uh, revenue. Thank you very much. Any a couple, um, Mr. Speaker, um, thank you. Just wanted to check, uh, so your, your budget this year though, or for FY19, you are estimating will be lower than FY17? That's correct. Why is that? Is that because you're expecting less? And then it says on your penalties for FY17, you received zero versus all the other years lists, uh, on your slides you list having received penalties for the other years, penalties and fines. Right. Well, that's po a portion of our revenue and uh, uh, most of it is because we're, we're proactive. I, I've been with the board since November 2011. We've attended uh, the, the um, the same uh, uh, meetings, their forums, I've spoke to them. We've also been proactive by uh, getting the word out on the violations that have happened and ensuring that people understand what's the appeals law. And so there were uh, some uh, complaints, but it resulted in, in no merit in the case. All right, and then I just wanted to know on your um uh, pie chart, you show that you're receiving $15,000 in building permit review fees. Does PEELS have a, a role in, in building permit reviews? Correct. We're part of the, the process. And so typically, uh, what happens is in the building permit, an engineer or architect is required to design whatever it is that you're building. Mm -hmm. So the part of the process is the, the applicant comes to our office. There's a $15 fee, so uh, that's the $15,000. And that's because you have your own architects or engineers that are reviewing their plans, or what, no, do you do? what we, is your role? We just ensure that the, those that have designed are registered on Guam, and that they're designing in their discipline. So a civil engineer oh. is designing civil, and an architect is designing architectural. That's all you review on, on Correct. Your We're plan. not looking at the plan itself and making sure that there, it's okay. 1,500 PSI or... All right. And then, and finally, I just want to know, there was this special authorization for an MOU between Peels, DPW, Contractors License Board, and the Guam Building Code Council for an attorney, to share an attorney, and how's that working out? Actually, it's, it's great because uh, we've been assigned uh, Attorney Keeler, and uh, so he's there at most of the meetings. Bef prior to this MOU, many of our meetings was not attended by the Attorney General, so the board was, uh, wasn't was able to make many decisions in the past. All right, so, all right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Just for the record, can you state your name uh, and your position? My name is uh, Ray Borja. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Borja, thank you for your presentation and also the information that you provided us. Um, and it's good to hear, like the speaker was saying a little earlier, you know, that you're not general fund funded. My question to you is, uh, knowing full well that you provide the licensure, you provide the permitting for uh, engineers and architects, do you also provide uh, an evaluation or an assessment of the environment out there, whether we need additional land surveyors or engineers or specific expertise in our community? Is that part of your 
oversight? No. No responsibility? And the reason why I bring this up, Mr. Speaker, perhaps what we can do is, is uh, look at any additional revenues that are generated above and beyond what the appeals board presently receives, that we look at a mechanism for providing some additional uh, educational assistance within uh, designated certified expertise areas. Because my last recollection, and I believe Mr. Bora, you were there at the same conference, that it was highlighted that several, uh, it may have been land surveyors, were anticipated to retire by the end of the year, and that will be down to six. That was the number that I recall very distinctly. And there was a plea from the individuals at that particular conference if by any chance the government can intervene and provide direct assistance. So now that we see that you're generating just a little bit more revenues than what you're spending on an annualized basis, perhaps that could be one area that the appeals board also ventures into in terms of looking at the environment, looking at the demand for specific expertise and then seeing if by any chance we can provide some educational assistance or support or certification program, because that would be very helpful to the industry. Now, just what I just shared with you with the land surveyors, how would that impact, because we anticipate increased activity over the course of the next uh, five, 10 years by virtue of some of the ongoing activities. What is a, an ideal number of land surveyors that the community uh, needs to be able to ensure that all the work is, is appropriately being addressed in a timely manner? Well, I think the, the current number, I think it's 18, but yes, active surveyors registered on island is probably about 12. And uh, I think that's a good number. I mean, definitely if, if there was more, uh, but uh, I, I think it's a good idea that somehow if, if we could use some of the PILS funds to to kind of encourage registration so that way in the future we're not uh, in, a, in a bad position because there's not enough surveyors to, to survey property on Guam. Well, Mr. Bora, I, I appreciate your, your response, but and, and in addition to that, certainly uh, I think we need to move in, in that direction in terms of creating an environment where we can encourage individuals to venture into this arena engineers as well as architects and perhaps uh, some educational assistance or incentive can be provided because we certainly don't want to see that number dwindle down from 12 actively registered and, and then the number that was shared at that conference was that when a few retire, Guam may be left with six active uh, surveyors out there and then the bulk of the work uh, the demand and the need for the services increase exponentially where there's so much backlog and then the government in this case is not helping to facilitate the process only because there's so much backlog and we expect the surveyors to continue to be very meticulous and to, be, to continue to be able to provide the best services that they possibly can. So I certainly hope to uh, work with you and, and the speaker in terms of, of possibly exploring those as options and not only the land surveyors, but any other components within the appeals board's responsibility. Certainly, uh, no, numbers should be presented so that there's sufficient justification. But thank you very much for uh, your presentation this morning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Maybe we'll have you speak to Mr. Sanford about a uh, contribution to the University of Guam, uh, to the School of Engineering, right, right. Uh, like they did uh, a couple of years ago to get people in. And as I understand it, um, I, I saw something recently. Are land surveyors now using drones for surveying? Do I, I, is that I'm not so sure. But I know nationally, because of technology is changing, uh, but if, if they're using it now as part of the process of surveying, I, I'm not sure. OK. because I. I thought I heard that a couple of young men, actually from Guam, are getting a degree in the States on drone surveying. So that may be the wave of the future. I, I think definitely it is. OK. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Borja. And you're very excused. Good. Thank you very much. Mr. Sanford?
going to have to push it again. There you go. Push harder. <laughs> uh, for the record, I'm Dave Sanford. And I'm representing the executive director for the Guam Board of Accountancy. I've submitted my written testimony, so I'm not going to read it. Um, but basically, the uh, three questions that were asked was the core mission of the agency, how do we serve the taxpayer? We uh, examine and um, essentially qualify candidates to sit for the CPA exam, then we administer the exam, and then once they pass the exam, uh, they get the requisite experience, and then we license them to practice as public accountants. Uh, and essentially the regulatory function is to make sure they're qualified so that uh, you don't have people that uh, are holding out to be a uh, qualified CPA to do accounting and do audits, financial audits and things of that nature and don't have the actual experience to do so. Um, in terms of the metrics we use, uh, basically it's licensing. The, the real function is uh, licensing. Uh, and we've uh, increased our licensees from uh, about a thousand or so when I started in 2004 to now uh, over 3,500 licensees. Many of our licensees are actually foreign uh, in foreign jurisdictions, uh, but they come to Guam for licensing. And uh, they're held to our standards and they've passed the US CPA exam. They're working for a lot of them are working for U.S. companies in foreign uh, destinations. So in terms of the uh, funding levels, um, we do not receive any funds from the government of Guam. Uh, we generate all our fees through, uh, all our funds through licensing fees. Uh, there's an application fee to take the exam. Uh, then uh, once you pass the exam, the licensing fee. And then it's a renewal fee every year. So. We're, we're getting close to a critical mass of licensees that renew every year so that we're hoping within another two to three years we'll be at a level with renewing licensees that would totally fund our operation without the Guam Computer Test Center. The Guam Computer Test Center is where we administer the CPA exam uh, and it's done through a contract between the Board of Accountancy and the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. And uh, we administer about six to 7,000 test events uh, annually in the test center. And we uh, receive about uh, four to 500,000 in revenues from that test center, uh, which is essentially what has funded the board for quite a while. And since we've risen to a level where we've got the excess fundings in 2015, we created the endowment fund, the, the Guam Accountancy Endowment Fund, which is dedicated through the University of Guam Endowment Foundation to supporting a visiting professor and lecturer program for the University of Guam. I'm happy to say that we've had two years now of visiting professors um, who've come and taught three classes each, both doctors. And uh, the, the student reaction has been very positive and we're also working with UOG to try to create a, uh, a PMBA focused in accounting because we had to increase our education requirements to 150 hours to meet the substantial equivalency requirements for the rest of the United States. And uh, we want to be able to graduate our local CPAs from UOG with the 150 hours to qualify for licensure as soon as they graduate. In that process, we also um, created a, a means bear whereby they can actually sit for the exam within 18 months of uh, uh, completing their degree or their education. So we're hoping that they can take the class, sit for the exam, by the time they graduate, they have the, the requisite number of educational hours, they've already passed the exam, and all they have to do then is get the experience to get licensed. So that's kind of where we're going with that. And to date, we've funded about one point, I think we're up to 1.8 million in the endowment fund. So that's about it. Um, anybody have any questions? I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> I, I want, I, on my behalf, I want to thank you for the very generous donation to the endowment fund at the university. Thank um, you. Because my office finance and budget is educated by your <laughs> By the well, end. that's true. You have a number of CPAs in yes. Canada. Yeah, so. and with the uh, but they're they're also studying up there, and so um, 
it's, it's imperative that, that yeah. we assist. And um, just so the public knows, rather than being a drain on us, you've, yeah. you're actually contributing, at least over the last several years, $1.8 million yeah. to assist the University of Guam in, in yeah. the education of future accountants. So yeah. again, I want to thank you very much for uh, the assistance that you've provided uh, over the last several years and hope that it will continue and if you would meet with the guy from the, Mr. Borja from the Peels <laughs> Board and convince him that an, an, a, uh, an endowment uh, amount to the university's new School of Engineering might uh, oh. be oh. something that they might want to think about uh, to assist. Well, we're, we're CPAs, we're advisors, so we can oh. give him a plan to create an endowment fund for engineering. And we do hope that uh, as long as uh, we don't see CPA exam testing in China, we should be able to continue funding the, the endowment fund, and that's our goal. As long, as long as we have those revenues from the test center, we'll be funding the endowment fund. Thank you very much. Any other senator wish to? Again, thank you again, Good. Mr. Sanford. Good. Thank you. Mr. Calvo. Please. Morning, Mr. Speaker, members of this August body. Uh, I'd like to thank you for providing us the opportunity to present our core mission as well as, uh, as how, how it relates to the um, budget. Uh, I prepared a um, uh, letter for the speaker and testimonial, um, and I'd just like to, I know everybody's been, been going over very briefly, and so I, I just assume uh, do this, do likewise. Uh, First and foremost, uh, we do depend on the government general fund, uh, as we are totally general fund uh, related. Uh, but we do provide a very vital service uh, to the government employee as well as the people of Guam in general. Uh, transmitted for your review and action is the core missions administered by the Civil Service Commission pursuant to 4GCA 4403 duties of the commission and 5GCA uh, 5625 through 5677 standards of conduct. A couple of things that I'd, I'd really like to uh, make sure um, uh, is addressed is, of course, the, the adverse actions, uh, appeals that we address, the grievance appeals, employ, employment uh, opportunity appeals. Uh, in addition, we do personal action investigations, post audit investigations, political activity investigations, public protection act investigations. And with the recent um, uh, concerns for the possibility of layoffs and furloughs and priority placement, uh, we provided some insight into that aspect as well as uh, ethics and procurement. Uh, furthermore, we've been under time standards uh, that has been very effective in, in uh, reducing our backlog. Uh, initially, when I came on, there was a three-year backlog. Uh, I'm happy to report that we are just under a year as far as uh, uh, cases uh, before us. Uh, however, we do have a, a a remaining substantial uh, number of cases still in the higher courts, uh, 35 at last count. And so uh, we, we continue to pursue those. Uh, uh, most of them are in, in, essentially tracking and providing testimony where, where required. Um, uh, lastly, of course, the Civil Service Commission was created by the Organic Act of Guam under uh, 1422C. And it, of course, it allows the legislature to establish a merit system and as far as practical appointments, promotions shall be made in accordance with such merit system. The government of Guam may, by law, establish civil service commission to administer the merit system. Uh, the services, as you can see, um, are listed there. Uh, I'd like to just indicate that uh, one of the most uh, significant things that I think that we provide is, is um, all the authorities that we have actually reduce the, the um, possibility of uh, spending more in the courts. And so we try and resolve um, the greater portion of our cases uh, at our level in order that uh, the courts aren't burdened with, um, with uh, you know, maybe some of the uh, cases that, that could go before it uh, that, that may not be as uh, serious as they really need to address. Uh, of course, our metrics uh, are listed there for your review as well. And um, uh, I know that, that we've um, 
been rated at a, at a priority number 305 uh, pursuant to public law 3487. However, because we do provide a vital service, um, I, I think that should be uh, reviewed just to, to assert, uh, ascertain the, um, the, the um, you know, serious nature of, of um, financial situations that could, could uh, uh, require, um, uh, although we've, we've kind of, and thank you for, for uh, you know, uh, giving us the direction in, in which we can skirt the uh, possibility of furloughs and layoffs, uh, there is still a reorganization that we see coming up, and we're um, anticipating uh, that there will be appeals in that reorganization as well, as with everything that happens, uh, people tend to be a little bit disgruntled when changes happen. And so we're there to address those, uh, those issues that they may have and hopefully work it out to, um, to the best of our ability in a, in a uh, harmonic way between management and employee. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm very happy that uh, you included in your testimony the fact that you were born from the Organic Act. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you, sir. Anybody have questions? Ask. Do you have your councils in-house? Uh, we have an administrative council uh, uh, position, although uh, in our initial cuts uh, we were uh, we had started recruitment. However, we delayed recruitment in order to meet our initial cuts. Uh, having had to uh, consider half of our budget was already expended, uh, you know, that was the easiest thing to do without uh, immediately tapping on uh, personnel. So, so um, we, we do hope to, to uh, re uh, reacquire the uh, administrative council in that it provides us a lot more flexibility. Uh, right now we're using our ALJs uh, strictly for the higher court uh, cases. Uh, focusing them on, on those cases, but uh, uh, so with the our, ALJs are by contract, case by case. Yeah, case by case. But we also have a um, a stipulation that allows for for them to to do as other assignments uh, may uh, may require. Because the contractual amount is is um, not changing. I mean, it's only eighty seven thousand. If I'm reading this correctly. Say again. The contractual amount under contractual services in your budget is only 87, wait, 70,000? I don't know which, option one is 87,000. Maybe option two is about 70,000. So that is what you're budgeting for? I, I believe the AOGs are funded under, under another um, oh. uh, separate budget, uh, another category within oh, our account. Uh, okay. Administrative law judge, 116,000 is what we're, we're actually how, budgeted for. How much? 116. Okay. And then you're, oh, sorry. Oh, and I also wanted to ask you. Sorry about that. I see it now. 116. Right. And then legal is 105. So that's for the in-house? Yes, that would be for the in-house as well as a legal secretary, which we have right now. Uh, doing double duty as a board secretary as well. Okay, and then, and then under boards, board of commissioners, you have salaries and benefits at 40,000 and miscellaneous at 28,000. Now I know they have a stipend. Yeah, the salaries and benefits cover the uh, board secretary, which uh, we had transferred, uh, which had transferred to another agency uh, during the, the um, cost cutting measure, uh, period. And um, uh, the stipends, of course, are for the board meetings. Uh, when we were at our heaviest schedule, we had three uh, board meetings uh, a week. And uh, that's anywhere between, uh, uh, we, we were fortunate in that, that, um, that we managed to, uh, to reduce the schedule. So now we're back to two uh, meetings a week. Uh, and we had tried to reduce it down to two meetings a month, however, because of the uh, time, time, uh, um, timelines requirement, uh, we, we do continue to address those uh, cases that require uh, additional uh, hearings for that month uh, because of the time standards. So under boards and board of commissioners in your testimony, the salaries and benefits is for one um, secretary, board secretary, board secretary plus stipends. Yes, and That's about it. Okay. Yes. And, and then finally, I, I mean, I, I wanted to know if you have any plans on issuing a, um, I don't know, advisory 
opinion or anything regarding the political activity? I think the last one I saw was quite um, dated, and I, if, or unless there's something more recent, or if you have any recommendations, I think. Uh, uh, with regards to uh, the, mm -hmm. we, do, we do conduct uh, mini hats training for primarily cabinet members, and then we opened it up this year to uh, government employees in general. Uh, we held three of those. Uh, the interest kind of waned after the third one. Uh, but we, we do take a lot of calls and we uh, respond to those calls. And as far as the, um, the, our mini hatch uh, pamphlet that we normally send out, uh, that we've updated that somewhat. Uh, the laws haven't really changed and so uh, uh, we're not uh, necessarily in, you know, um, doing anything new. Uh, we, we did um, bring up some of the, the issues that, um, uh, that seem to be a concern, uh, of course, uh, uh, with the signage, uh, they, they ask us about the signage. That's beyond our purview. It's basically DPW as far as uh, the signage with the exception of um, if it becomes a uh, formal complaint to us, then we will, we will investigate it. Uh, but, but as far as answering, you know, whether they can put it on that property or not, uh, it's, it's out of our jurisdiction. All right. So, so you think you've updated your um, advisory pamphlets uh, according to Guam's law? But do you think Guam's law is uh, consistent with? Uh, um, is it at the state that it should be at? Uh, none. Uh, thank you for asking that question, Senator. Mm -hmm. in, in, indeed, we are a little bit um, uh, confused at times with, with certain aspects of the law and. Uh, and we are um, uh, suggesting, I've, had, I've uh, actually directed my uh, personal management uh, administrator to, to uh, include in, in um, uh, part of our talks with uh, Senator Torres to, uh, to look at, um, at the, the um, uh, certain issues regarding the political activity to uh, fine line uh, that one a little bit more to be more explanatory, uh, as well as uh, our null and void issue. Uh, to, to give it um, a little bit more um, uh, confirmation as to the direction that we're supposed to take. All right, yeah. Um, yes, I'd like to hear if, if your counsel or any of your yeah, legal staff has, uh, has any opinions regarding that that we could, we could uh, also review. Yeah, okay. And, and then finally, I just wanted... Um, uh, I lost it, sorry. Uh, that's all, Mr. Chair. I, I can't remember what it was. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Calvo, for your presentation. Um, I also wanted to ask questions about the legal and the administrative law judge um, sections of your budget here. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you could inform the committee about the role that these legal professionals play and maybe their interaction with the board? If you could just tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, yes, um, uh, part of the, uh, at the onset, bringing on the ALJs uh, was targeted uh, primarily at the reducing the number of cases that the, um, the commissioners would actually address. Uh, although, uh, upon reviewing the cases, uh, hearing the cases uh, from the parties, they do uh, provide a report to the commissioners in which they, he recommends a, um, uh, a de decision uh, to be made. Uh, the commissioners still have that authority to make that decision. That so the decision. ALJ reviews all cases and not, then... Not all cases. Okay. J just particular cases that the commission may assign to them. So. Okay. So they're only reviewing cases when asked? Uh, when, when assigned, yes. When assigned. Yeah. There, there is, uh, uh, there has been some um, uh, conflict of interest with regards to cases that we, we had uh, uh, requested uh, for them to entertain and uh, they've, they've readily uh, uh, asserted that conflict of interest and withdrew. And so um, those cases, of course, uh, the commissioners will, will continue to take on uh, and uh, in, in um, with our administrative council, of course, uh, we had, uh, them actually providing us uh, the, uh, that individual providing us the legal guidance uh, with some of those more difficult cases. Uh, with the ALJs, we have to basically uh, uh, ensure that there's no conflict of interest. And if there is, then we, we, we have been looking at a uh, contract lawyer 
uh, in the interim while we're still recruiting uh, for the ALJ, I mean, uh, the administrative legal. Uh, so would you say to in provide. the total number of cases that come through the Civil Service Commission, what is the percentage um, that require or where the board asks for legal review? Uh, in, it's always helpful to have um, uh, uh, some legal um, advice uh, when making a decision that, that impacts an inv individual's uh, livelihood. I agree. And so um, whenever the, the commissioners uh, feel uh, that they, they need uh, to dig into it a little bit more, they request for the administrative council to provide a briefing to them. I understand. So, so, but on the whole, what would you say is like a percentage of the amount of times that the board will request for the ALJ or for legal to review cases? Like 50%, 25%, what would you say? Uh, it could be as high as 50. It depends on the, on the, um, the technic technical aspects of, of the cases before them. And do you think that this is a good method going forward? Do you think that all cases should be reviewed by legal or do you feel like the board requesting for a legal review is a good enough well, our board, our board uh, of commissioners is very, um, uh, first of all, they're very uh, knowledgeable in, in the human resource uh, uh, side and, and they've uh, always been managers here and there. Uh, in addition, they, they, uh, most of them have a, a lengthy record of being on the commission already. And so in some cases, they don't necessarily require uh, uh, legal uh, uh, support but in the more technical cases, especially the ones that come up, uh, uh, you know, um, with new uh, issues, uh, of course, like with the Guam solid waste issue, we have to get a little bit of more background regarding that uh, because it was just, uh, we, the organization had to be clarified. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I remember my question now, and that was, um, you had mentioned certain cost-cutting measures that you had, your agency had taken. Yes, so what is the status now of those cost-cutting measures? Are you still implementing those, or have you repealed those? For example, you said you had transferred one of the board secretary to another agency, and so yes, what's the status now? Well, actually, um, uh, our initial response to the, to the first call for cuts uh, was to uh, delay our, the hiring of our administrative consul uh, who had departed for another job. And uh, in doing that, that, that basically covered the bulk of our, our uh, cost-cutting measure. Uh, in addition, we uh, initially uh, cut the commissioner's hearing, uh, number of hearings per month. And, um, you know, uh, that, that was the other, with a small agency like ours, it's really hard to to find other areas to cut, of course, our supplies and everything were cut automatically. Uh, anything that had nothing to do with personnel was, was immediately cut. And um, uh, uh, then, then after we made that initial cut, we knew that, that uh, there was a possibility of a second one coming. Uh, fortunately, our, our uh, board secretary had, uh, had taken an interview elsewhere and was actually selected. And although she did not want to leave us, um, you know, it was, it was actually a better thing for her to, to be more secure um, for her family. And so um, uh, that also assisted. But uh, I, I also, um, at the call of the governor, we, uh, in the cabinet, had also uh, volunteered to, to go on a 32-hour work week, which I did. And so from those uh, savings, uh, we were able to not just meet our, our uh, cost-cutting uh, targets, but um, but also uh, allowed to reinstate uh, a major portion of the commissioner's uh, hearing nights. And uh, we're still looking at, at uh, you know, just exactly how many we're gonna need uh, to meet to finish off the year. So you were able to accomplish enough savings and now you are able to um, remove that freeze on the hiring of the administrative Council? We, we hope to do that. Right now, we, don't, we haven't found the money. We're, we're hoping to, um, to I asked uh, my ASO to analyze uh, what it would uh, cost between uh, May or June to September to cover the, the recruitment of that, that position. And uh, I haven't yet uh, received that. 
uh, analysis. All right, and then and then you know the bu budget uh, was the budget was submitted to us with option one and option two. Yes, ma'am. But for your agency, there's only about a hundred thousand dollars difference, maybe even less than that, right. between right. option one and option two. And um, so, what is the total savings that you had accomplished uh, with your cost-cutting measures? Approximately one hundred and twelve thousand uh, was right. was the target. I believe. All right. Okay. Thank you. Again, Mr. Calva, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, for the efforts that you've made to, for, in your cost cutting. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, continue to please thank the commissioners for all the good work that they do for us. Thank okay. you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. We stand in recess until 2 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs>